um, from the cave of Adullam, David wrote, probably wrote this psalm with the great experience of how the Lord had uh, allowed him to escape from the hands of um, Achish. Well, of course, Pastor Harris got to have his joke of the day. I got five or six of them for you today, okay? Corny food jokes. Sometimes jokes are so corny that they're funny, you know, and that's kind of, I hope, I hope these are. Otherwise, they're just corny, all right? What do you call a fake noodle? You call it an impasta. <laughs> You'll see why I got food jokes later on in this thing. Okay, Mushroom walks into a bar. Bartender says, hey, you can't drink here. Mushroom says, why not? I'm a fun guy. Fun guy. I'm a fun guy. What do you call cheese that isn't yours? Maybe you've heard this one. I've heard this one before. Nacho cheese, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, why couldn't the sesame seed leave the gambling casino? Because he was on a roll. <laughs> Get it? He was on a roll. <laughs> why don't eggs tell jokes to each other? Because they don't want to crack each other <laughs> up. Ha, ha, ha. All right. Now I've done enough of the dumb jokes. Let's jump into this. Okay. Okay, so... Uh, last week, we looked at the title. David had written this from the cave of Adullam after, after uh, Abimelech or Achish had driven him out because he had acted crazy. He had acted insane, and uh, they drove him away out into the wilderness. He went to the cave of Adullam. He wrote this psalm. Last week, we looked at the first three verses, verses of praise. We looked at six different words that David used for praise last week. Now we're going to be going on, starting at verse 4. Um... Let me read it for you. Four through ten. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. Verse seven. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. And in verse 10, the young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good Thing. Okay, there's our text for this morning. Here's our outline of the entire psalm. I'm going to be taking three, three sermons, last week's, this week's, and next week's on this. You remember last week we looked at the title, um, the setting, one of the few psalms that gives us the exact setting of where this psalm was written and taken place. And then we looked last week at David's praise. This week we're going to do points three and four. David's testimony, David shares his testimony about what the Lord had done. And then we're going to go on to verses 8 through 10 and look at David's invitation. David's invitation. Next week, we're going to look at verses 11 through the end. The fear of the Lord, near to the brokenhearted, and going through affliction. We're going to cover those three next week. Dan looks at me, yeah, we're going to cover that much? Yeah, we can make it through that next week. Okay, so this week we're going to cover point three and point four, David's testimony and then David's invitation. All right, so let's look at that. First of all, David's testimony, and we're going to look at these verses individually. Each one individually we're going to look at. Okay, first of all, verse four, he says this, I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. All right, you remember the setting. David was fleeing from Saul. He thought he'd try this. He went down to um, a Philistine city, Gath. And he was going to try to hide in the Philistine city. And uh, the servants of Achish, the king, recognized David. Hey, that's the guy, the Israels, when they sing, they sing Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his tens of thousands and part of those tens of thousands were Philistine warriors. They recognized him. 
Now, we don't know exactly what happened. Perhaps they arrested him because it has, as he scratched on the doors, was that a prison door that's talking about there? But uh, they arrested perhaps David, and then they went to King Achish, and they said, Achish, we got, we got this guy who killed many Philistine warriors. And in the meantime, David comes up with this plan. Now, we talked about this last week. Was this plan of the Lord, or was it his own running ahead of the Lord? But in here... David is waiting to find out at any moment they could swipe off his head or they could run him through. He could be a dead man in the middle of this Philistine city captured and having killed bunches and bunches of Philistine warriors. David says he was desperate. He was fearful. It tells us in that story back in 1 Samuel chapter 21. It says he was fearful. And what did he do? He sought the Lord. That tells us something about our own lives. When we get into trouble, do we get independent and try and solve it on our life? Or do we drop to our knees and do we seek the Lord? David sought the Lord. The Lord answered me, he says, and delivered me from all my fears. There's his testimony. He says, I was in trouble. I prayed, I sought the Lord, the Lord heard my prayer, and the Lord answered my prayer. I come before King Achish, and King Achish says, get that guy out of here, drive him out in the wilderness, he's a crazy man. And David was freed. David shares his testimony. I say here, after the verses of praise, which we looked at last week, now David turns to share his testimony. David relates to others what the Lord has done for him. So get the picture. He fled to the cave right after the story of King Achish driving him away. It says David fled to the cave of Adullam. Okay, can you imagine living in the cave? And David is sitting there and David thinks, wow, my stupid plan of acting crazy, that isn't what got me out of there. You know what got me out of there? The Lord got me out of there. And so David says, you know what, I'm going to write a psalm about this and share this with others. So David sits down in that cave, probably found a nice little stone and sat down there, pulls out his ballpoint pen. By the way, you left your pen here last week. I got it at home. I stole it. I got it at home. I'll get... David is writing and he is, writes it. He starts writing this. He writes 22 verses. Each verse starts with We mentioned this last week. It is an acrostic psalm. Starts with one of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So he's trying to come up with all of these. Now, why did David want to do that? Because that was a memorization technique they had in biblical times, making acrostic psalms so that people would memorize. David wanted people to know that the Lord answers prayers. David wanted people to know this psalm. So he shares his testimony. I was in trouble. I sought the Lord. The Lord heard me and delivered me. For the believer, our testimony can be a powerful tool for sharing Christ with others. Now, we often use that term testimony. Okay, I I used it in my outline, David's testimony. Now, there are two kinds of testimonies. One kind of testimony is how you got saved, okay? You were in, we'll look at maybe a possible outline, but your testimony of salvation is a powerful witnessing tool. You know, what's kind of neat about you sharing your testimony, if you start arguing the Bible, say say you're having coffee, having lunch with an unsaved person, and you want to start sharing the gospel with them, and you start throwing Bible verses at them, and they say, yeah, but I don't believe that. No, you get, no, and, and they start arguing with you. But if you share your testimony, they can't argue with it. Because this, this is what happened to me in my life. Now, I know they can say, well, yeah, I know there were these Christians, and then they met some Mormons, and they listened to the Mormons, and the Mormonism changed their life, you know. But I know there are some testimonies like that. But they're far outnumbered by Christian testimonies. Share your testimony with others, and the Lord can use your testimony. The Lord can use your testimony on their heart to bring them to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Your testimony is a very powerful tool that they can't argue with because it's happened to you in your life. 
David, uh, that's the first kind of testimony. Another kind of testimony is how is the Lord working in your life right now? Yeah, you know, you seem to have a problem with, 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 with anger. I saw you get mad at uh, the, the, I think of the, anyone watched the Tigers game last night? Martinez didn't like that one call, and so he argued with the ump, and the ump goes, you're out of here! And then the manager comes out, or the pitching coach comes out, and he kicked the pitching coach out, and then the manager comes out, Osmus comes out, and he kicked Osmus out, and a couple of batters later, J.D. Martinez starts arguing with the ump, and he kicked J.D. Martinez out of the game. Yeah? <laughs> so you got, kind of got a problem with anger. Well, you know what? I, I, I have it in my past. I've had a problem with anger, but I began to pray about it. And you know what? The Lord is helping me with my anger. See, there's a testimony you can, you can share. What is the Lord doing in your life right now? What has he been doing recently in your life? If people see a vibrant walk of you with the Lord, that will impress them. And they will say, you know what? I need that same kind of thing in my life. I need help with my everyday problems. That's the kind of testimony David is sharing here. David says, you know what? I was in trouble. I could have been run through by a Philistine spear at any moment. But I sought the Lord. I prayed. The Lord heard me. And the Lord delivered me, helped me, got me out of my circumstance. David shares that testimony. Okay, next slide, I say this. Here's a good outline for your testimony, okay? Um, this is kind of the testimony of, sal of your salvation, but here's a nice little outline. As you share, number one, you can share what your life was like before you came to Christ. Number two, share how uh, many came to accept Jesus as their Savior, how you came to accept Jesus as your Savior. And then thirdly, uh, how your life is changed now since you've accepted Christ. That's a good outline for your, for your testimony as you work on your testimony. You should practice your testimony. Sit in front of a mirror. I know, be probably kind of rough looking at that guy uh, looking at you in the mirror. Some of us, it's a little bit easier than others of us, but talk to the mirror, share your testimony, practice your testimony. Maybe sit down with another believer and practice that. Get used to sharing your testimony so that it can flow and come more naturally when you are, get the opportunity to share your testimony with unsaved people. Again, your testimony is what the Lord has done for you or is doing now in your life can affect people in a significant way. Your testimony is a powerful tool for evangelism. All right, so David shares his testimony. Verse 5, those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. You know, the word that jumps out at me as I read that is the word radiant. When the Lord reached down, helped David, as David, I can just see David, he's in that cave, and at first he's kind of stunned. They drove me away, I didn't get killed, and here I am, I fled to the cave of Adullam, and then all of a sudden he begins to think, wow, the Lord did that. And all of a sudden, breaking across his face comes a great big smile. Hey, the Lord rescued me. He blessed me. He took care of me. I prayed, and the Lord delivered me. And so David writes that into his psalm. He says, their faces are radiant. I looked that up in the Hebrew. It is the Hebrew word nahar. It means, its primary meaning is to shine, right? Radiant. A believer's face Sometimes when we come in and we sing these songs, oh, happy day. You know, we, we, we are sad and we should be excited and joyful. We talked about joy last week. We should be excited and joyful about what the Lord has done for us. It also can mean to flow as in a river. It's interesting. If you know anything about Hebrew, if you study Hebrew, 
Hebrews had wide diversity of meaning. They got a very, compared to other languages, a very low vocabulary, very few words in their language, but they have multiple meanings for their words. This one not only means shine, but it also means to flow. And you can kind of see the, the, the similarities between that light flowing out of somebody just as a river flows. In fact, the noun form for the Hebrew word uh, nahar, the noun form of that is the word river. Okay, means to flow. I got uh, When the Lord does something great in our lives, our outward appearance will be affected. We will be radiant. It should flow out of our lives. People should be able to see that. Jesus uh, needed to go through Samaria, John chapter 4. I got a cross reference here. Now, he didn't need to. Many times, because the Jews hated the Samaritans, they would go out and around Samaria. But it says at the beginning of verse, uh, chapter 4, Jesus needed to go to, through Samaria. He sent, they came to a town. Jesus sent the disciples to get some food, and Jesus stayed at the well, and there he met this woman wasn't a very nice woman, had had six husbands, and the man she was now sleeping with was not her husband. And, but Jesus started talking to her. And Jesus began to talk to her about her spiritual life. Oh, yeah. and she said, well, I know us Samaritans, we are different than you. You guys worship in the temple. We worship on Mount Gerizim. And she wanted to get into the differences and stuff. But Jesus began to talk to her about the living water that could flow out of her life. Jesus said this, But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. That's the kind of water that the Lord Jesus Christ can give to us, flowing out of our lives. There was a Jewish holiday um, John chapter 7. And in that holiday, they took this big picture of water and they dump it out and they recite some Old Testament verses. Jesus, at that celebration in Jerusalem, stood up amongst all the people and he says, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow. I know, this was Greek. Had that been Hebrew, that would have been our word back there in, uh, in um, the Old Testament, Nahar will flow rivers of living water. In other words, out of our lives, people ought to see something in us that they don't have. And they should want it. Because we had been with the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a vibrant, walking relationship with him. We're willing to share the testimony about how what the Lord is doing in our lives. All right, next verse. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Who's this poor man? We're, we're small enough. <laughs> nice little Bible study group here where we can interact with each other. Yeah, that's David, huh? So actually, here, here's what I say. Uh, David again shares his testimony. He basically repeats verse 4 with different words. You know, we find that all the time in the Old Testament. They'll state something and then they'll use some different words, but they'll try to say the same thing using different words. Okay, So let's look at verse 6, and then I've repeated verse 4 here for us, um, basically saying the same thing, right? He shared his testimony. But slight differences, and those differences you can, you can pick up on. What are some differences between 6 and 4? For one thing, he changed it from first person to third person. This poor man, instead of I, huh? This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, the Lord answered, and the Lord saved him out of his troubles. The Lord delivered him from all my fears. Troubles and fears, different words, saved versus delivered. Basically, he repeats his testimony again with different words. He wanted to share this testimony with others. He wanted them to get it. He shares his testimony. By the way, that word that's used up there, this one, delivered, means to be helped in an immediate crisis. 
The word that he uses in verse 6 for saved, it's interesting, it is part of the name Joshua, the Lord, Jehovah, saves, um, which in the New Testament, do you know what the name Joshua is in the New Testament brought into Greek? The name Joshua from the Old Testament brought into Greek is the name Jesus. Yeah, the Lord saves. And though David is probably talking about the instance there where he was delivered, saved from the hand of Achish, the Philistine king, that's the word that is used for our eternal salvation when the Lord Jesus Christ saves our lives. Saves. All right, verse 6. When the Bible repeats something, verse 4 and verse 6, <laughs> it is important. Remember we talked last week. Paul says in Philippians, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, people, just in case you didn't get it the first time, rejoice. David says in verse 4, how the Lord shared his testimony. Just in case you didn't get it the first time, he repeats it again. My wife was talking to me the other day and talked to me during one of the interesting television shows. Uh, uh, okay, okay, yeah. Huh? Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. And then afterwards, she says, well, did you do such and such and such? Huh? You didn't, you didn't tell me to do that. <laughs> I told you to do it. Well, if she had just repeated it, you know, when I wasn't listening to the TV, it, I'd have heard it. Yeah? David says, just in case you didn't hear me in verse 4, I'm going to repeat it again in verse 6. When God tells us something a second time, we better be listening that second time. Your wife will forgive you for not <coughs> your wife will forgive you for not listening the first time, but if she has to tell you twice, man, then you're really in trouble. You better be listening that second time. Next verse. Verse 7. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Isn't that an interesting verse? There are scriptures. We're going to look at a couple of them. There are scriptures. David is thinking, okay, I went down to, to, to Gath, and I thought I could hide in the city, but they recognized me. They arrested me. They had spears. They had knives. They had all kinds of weapons. They could have killed me. And uh, I, was, I was in this, in this uh, cell. I pretended to be crazy in that cell. And then I come before their king. I had killed many Philistine warriors. There's no reason they should have just killed me outright, but the Lord delivered me. How could, how come, how come a Philistine warrior didn't pull out his knife at any moment and run me through? How come? David says, I'll bet you. I didn't see him. Now, there are times in the Old Testament when they did see him. Remember that story when Elisha, Elisha, Elijah, pray, I think it was Elisha, prayed for his servant and the Lord opened the eyes of his servant and he saw those angels, an army of angels around the whole city. David might not have seen him, but David says, I'll bet you the Lord sent his angel to be there by me and protect me while I was arrested there in those Philistines. Let me just show you another uh, cross-reference. Um, Psalm 91, uh, and I tried to find, we don't know who wrote Psalm 91. It doesn't say a Psalm of David. Could have been David. Moses wrote Psalm 90. Perhaps David, uh, Moses wrote Psalm 91 as well. We don't know who wrote Psalm 91, but this is what it says in there. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Isn't that interesting? By the way, this is an interesting verse because this is quoted in the New Testament. Let me ask you. Who, quo who quotes this in the New Testament? Satan. Satan quoted this verse. You don't think Satan knows scripture. Satan could quote Psalms, huh? Satan tried to get Jesus to fall, to yield to temptation during the period of time when he was going through the temptations. Satan quoted this to Jesus. Isn't that a picture? Satan is quoting scripture to Jesus, huh? Well, of course, he's misusing it. He's trying to get Jesus to fall to, 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 to him, follow him. But, but it indicates that he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. 
there are scriptures, we don't know the whole story, we don't know what goes on in the spiritual realm, but it seems that there are scriptures that indicate there are angels who are there to help us in our lives. We don't know what that exact ministry is. There are other verses. But I want, I want you to notice something. What's that first word in verse 7? I know, a real simple word. <laughs> the angel of the Lord. Now there's an interesting study. There are places in the New Test or places in the Old Testament where it talks about angels and a an angel, but there are places where it is translated because of a definite article. Hebrew did not have a definite article, but they had ways of indicating it. It is translated the angel of the Lord. And if you study those passages, not always, but sometimes when it is talking about the angel of the Lord, it is the Lord himself coming in human form. We call that a theophany. If it was the second person of the Trinity, they may call it a Christophany, an appearance of Christ or an appearance of God in the Old Testament. Sometimes it calls that person the angel of the Lord. If this is referring to the angel of the Lord, it wasn't just an angel who was sitting next to the Lord, to, to David when he was there among the Philistines. It was the Lord himself who was encamped around him. What does it mean to encamp? Stay there. Put your tent down. Be there. The Lord was with David throughout this whole situation. The Lord, the angel, the angel of the Lord encamped around him when he was in his trouble in Gath among King Achish. All right, so there's verse 7. Verse 8, one more in this section. Verse 8, oh no, I'm sorry. 8 through 10, starting the second part of my sermon now. All right. David has shared his testimony. He shared, I was in trouble. I prayed. I sought the Lord. The Lord heard me, and the Lord answered me. The Lord was with me. The Lord answered me. He states it twice. He says, my face is radiant because the Lord has answered me. He shared his testimony. David wants others now to do something with that. He wants them to trust the Lord. He wants them to follow the Lord. He wants them to seek the Lord. He says this, verse 8, well-known verse. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. I can just see. Now, this is the eighth, eighth verse. Oh, uh, uh, let, me, let me just see here. Begins with the Hebrew letter tet, okay? The eighth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Remember, each verse begins with uh, a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. David is sitting in that cave writing out this acrostic psalm. David has finished his testimony. He says, okay, now I want, I want the people to, 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 to begin to fear the Lord, or at, least, or at least to try it a little bit. So what word can I use here to get the people to, to, to try out the Lord? I know. I'll use the Hebrew word taste. Hebrew word is ta'am. I know. You know, you know it's kind of interesting. Hebrews, uh, Hebrew language does not have diphthongs. You say, what's a diphthong? Well, in English, when we put two vowels together, it forms one sound. I-E or E-I, that's, uh, that's one sound. O-U, uh, one sound. Yeah? Hebrew, you don't do that. Remember the God of the Canaanites that, they would, uh, that the Israelites would often worship when they weren't supposed to? What was his name? We always say he was Baal. Baal. Yeah, you know, we're pronouncing that wrong. In Hebrew, it's B-A-A-L. Baal. It was really two syllables. They don't have diphthongs. Those two A's don't make one sound. Two separate syllables. Same way for this word, ta'am. It means to taste. Literally, it means to taste. Figuratively, when you are tasting something, you are trying it out. Okay, right? You want, you're going to experience it. There is a restaurant down on the corner, uh, Burlingame and 28th Street. Not too far from Dell's house. Uh, the north, 
west corners, kind of a strip mall type of thing there. There's a few th- places in there, but it's an, it's an, it's an, and a smile comes to my face as I talk about, it's an all-you-can-eat Chinese rest uh, buffet, okay? In fact, I think the name of it is China Buffet, something like that. We go in there, and they got all the good things. It's a big restaurant. They got, um, I don't know, I couldn't think of the word, but they got long what, serving tables where they got all, you put all the hot dishes in and stuff like that. What do you call that thing? A buffet, I guess, okay? <laughs> well, they got, they got three of those with all of your main regular Chinese food. Oh, and they got good stuff. I like those chicken skewers. Um, I always get an egg roll. I always have an egg roll. I love, I love those wontons. I get those crab, crab meat with that, with, with the, with the, what is that in there? Um, cream cheese on the inside of those, and they make it look like a little flower shape, and then they deep fry it, wonton. All the good stuff. Really good food. Good stuff. They have another one in the back with all the desserts. And, you know, these Chinese desserts, they're not sweet. They're not like our American desserts, you know. I, I don't know. But then they got another one. Sits the other direction. These three, these three with all the main good stuff on goes this way. Then they got another one for, and you ladies will appreciate this, they got another one for the salads, all right? Now, on weekdays, they got normal salad stuff, okay? You got your lettuce, you got your... your dressings and croutons and bacon bits and stuff you put on it. On weekends, they add a whole bunch of stuff. Weird stuff. <laughs> weird stuff. For one thing, they got sushi, okay? And that's not so weird, but you know, they got the leaves and they roll the, the, they roll the raw fish up in these leaves and they cut them and they slice them nice. It looks really nice. They got that. They got snails. Uncooked, unprepared snails. And you get this little thing and you try to pop that snail out of there. And you <laughs> Here's the other thing they got on there. They got a bowl of, oh, I didn't, I didn't, what did you say? They got a bowl of dead, raw, uncooked, little tiny octopuses. Ew. Yeah. Now, by the way, I, I looked that word up. Um, what's the plural of octopus? Uh, well, you would think so. In Latin, if you got a U.S. on the end of our English words, usually the plural would be uh, uh, octopi. But they said there are ex- three acceptable ones. There are octopi. The most commonly used is octopuses. Yeah, you know, a, I think that's most common because nobody remembers it should be octopi, and so they say octopuses. And then there's octopods. I don't know why they call them that. But anyway, anyway, I'll just call it octopi. That sounds good, you know. I know in school when I have more than one syllabus, it's a syllabi. It's syllabi. Yeah, well, anyway, so I'll call them octopi. Well, I, I, I go there, and I usually skip that salad bar area. You know, I love my meats, and I'm getting all of the, the fried rice, and then I get all of the, the, the pork and the chicken and all of that on there. But I walk by there, and I saw those dead octopuses, octopi, <laughs> in this bowl. I found this picture on the internet. They didn't look as nice as this. They were just uh, a whole, the little tiny heads. On. I don't know what, how they get them like that. Usually on the National Geographic, you see octopuses that are octopi that are this big. You know, well, these are a bunch of little baby, dead baby octopi. I, I don't know. I don't know. And uh, so I says, I says, ew, I don't want one of those. And then I said to myself, I says, well, why do they put them out here? I mean, I like this chi- this restaurant. I like Chinese food. And on weekends, they put a bunch of extra stuff on the salad bar, and it's kind of, kind of, somebody, somebody must eat these things. So next to my four or five wontons that I had on my plate, along with the fried rice and all the other good stuff on it, sweet and sour pork and everything, I took their little tongs and I fished one of these dead octopi out and I dropped it on my plate and I went and sat down. Of course, I ate all the other stuff first, you know, all oh, the good stuff. And then I looked down at it and I said, oh. I says, I know, I know if you go to Red Lobster, they got, they got calamari, you know, and they even got calamari salad, you know. So, so, but, but I, I, so here's what I had to do. I said, John, you need to try it. You need to taste it just once. So I took my fork and stuck it into one of his little tiny tentacles, and I <laughs> cut off one of those tentacles, and I stabbed that thing, and I brought it up to my mouth, and I tried it. Yeah, yeah, I tried it. I figured I had to do it at least once. 
Now, maybe this isn't a very good illustration because, because I really didn't like it. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't spit it out. I didn't chew it up. I left the rest of it on my plate, but I did try one of the tentacles. I tried it. David said here in verse 8, he says, I want you to taste and see. And David, in the, in the real Hebrew, it says, the Lord will not be like one of those dead octopuses. You will enjoy his goodness. He will be good. Just try him. You know, in the book of Malachi, the Israelites quit tithing. And they were going through hard times. There were, there were droughts and their crops weren't coming in. And the Lord says, you know, first accuses them, you're not bringing your tithes into the storehouse. And then the Lord says, why don't you test me? Why don't you try me out? Why don't you start tithing and see if I don't open up the heavens and pour out all kinds of blessings on you? David is saying the same thing here. He says, I've shared my testimony. I prayed. I trusted in the Lord. The Lord blessed me. And, and, and the Lord came through. He says, I want you to try it. Taste and see that the Lord is good. All right, let's go on from our dead octopi. All right, last two verses. I, I put nine and ten together. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. I went to a site online. I was watching a national, I like to watch the National Geographic channel. There's Nat Geo and then there's Nat Geo Wild on there, and they often have, you know, African safari lions out in the wilderness. Lions do not catch their prey every time. Against common belief, we think they chase after those little, um, I forget the name of the antelope. There's a bunch of different antelope or zebras or whatever. They don't catch them every time. In fact, according to the internet, and the internet don't lie, right? <laughs> when African lions hunt alone, they are successful in one out of six attempts. One out of six. Huh? Uh, if you're a ball player and you come up to the plate and you strike out, um, you know, five out of six times, you're not a very good ball player. One out of six attempts, they get their prey. When they hunt in a group, and they often hunt in, their, in a group, they're successful one in three. So they don't, get their, they don't get their prey every time. They go hungry. And David says, there's a lot of young lions out there who are hungry. But if you are willing to seek the Lord, you won't go hungry. Now, I want to focus in, as you read verse 9, isn't this interesting? He says, oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. Fear the Lord. That's kind of an odd thing to say. We think, no, you got to love the Lord, you got to seek the Lord, you got to trust the Lord. But throughout the Old Testament and the New, we are told that we are to fear the Lord. Now, does, as believers, does that mean, uh, oh no, I can't come to the Lord? Hebrews says, come boldly before the throne of grace. Mm -hmm. But fear says, this verse promises that the Lord will bless those who fear him. To fear the Lord may seem strange to us. Fear the Lord? He died on the cross for me. It, the fear of the Lord, though, is to submit to his rule and recognize his lordship in our lives. That's my definition, I think, of the fear of the Lord. We are to be in awe of him. And through the Lord Jesus Christ, we can come boldly before the throne of grace, but it's only through the Lord Jesus Christ. The unsaved will be cast into eternal judgment. The Bible describes it as a lake of fire. They will be cast there forever and ever and ever. We need to have a healthy fear of the Lord for who he is. Recognize his lordship. I got an illustration that I'll kind of close my message with. In 1888, William Ernest Henley published a short untitled poem. When he first published it, it was untitled. It took on the name, people began calling it Invictus. It became a very well-known uh, it was the epitome of rebellion against the Lord, and it became very, oh, I spelled very wrong, it became very popular in his time. I want to read you the poem, Invictus, and you can see 
what it was like. It was out and out rebellion against the Lord and any rule that he might have in a person's life. Here's Invictus. It's a short little poem. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit, from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul, he says. In the foul clutch of circumstance, he's saying God don't have any control, it's just circumstance. I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloodied but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It's a picture of a man standing there rebelling against God and saying, I'm going to stand and nothing's going to conquer me. And then the last verse. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. God has no ability to conquer me. I am the captain of my soul. Christian response to that. In the early 20th century, a few years after he had published that and it became very popular, people in the late 1800s could quote Invictus, those who were rebellious against God, who did not fear the Lord, it became a very famous poem. Uh, Dorothy Day responded to Henley's poem with this poem that she titled Conquered. Isn't that interesting? Invictus, she says conquered. I want to read that one. Out of the light that dazzles me, bright as the sun from pole to pole, I thank the God I know to be, that's a little different than what, what Henley had said, for Christ, the conqueror of my soul, since his, the sway of circumstance, the Lord has control of all the circumstances in her life, I would not wince nor cry aloud under the rule which man called chance, my head with joy is humbly bowed. Interesting, changing uh, Henley's words to be Christian concept. Beyond this place of sin and tears, that life with him and his the aid that spite the menace of the years keeps and will keep me unafraid. She says, I'm unafraid, but that's because the Lord is with me. And then that last verse, I have no fear, though straight the gate. He cleared the punishment, the scroll, from punishment, the scroll. Christ is the master of my fate. Christ is the captain of my soul. She's saying we need to fear the Lord. We need to give the Lord Jesus Christ the proper place in our lives. When we fear the Lord, he will take care of us. All right, conclusion. Be willing to share your testimony with others. David says, the Lord blessed me. I saw at him. Uh, the Lord blessed me, and I need to share that with others. If the Lord has affected your life, you need to be willing to share that with others. Not just your salvation testimony, but how the Lord is working in your life every day. Thirdly, then be willing to invite them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Try them out. Try it out. Dan, while you're coming, we'll close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for David's testimony. David tells us in his life where this took place. And Father, he shared that he looked to you and you blessed him. Father, may we be willing to share with others. And may we be willing to invite others to taste and see that the Lord is good. Thank you, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.